Children's House. My friend and brother, Dr. Elwood, certainly to you, Lady Elwood, and thank all of you for being present in this place on this day. Very quickly, Vote Common Good is a movement that encourages religious voters to vote with their neighbor in mind. What's going to improve the livelihood of my neighbor? Isn't that what God says above the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and what your neighbor as yourself? And certainly we've been crisscrossing the country. Uh, we were just in Grand Rapids. We were in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Nashville. We're getting ready to embark upon now a Deep South tour because we recognize that unfortunately in the midst of this election, there are certain constituencies that we're not properly engaging, in particularly our young people and HBCUs. And so we're going to do that as a part of this. We give the Lord a hand to be a part of the power of the Lord. Very quickly, because I don't have a lot of time. One, we have a table set up at the Family Life Center. We'd love for you to come and visit the table. We have information for you concerning facts and fiction for the Georgia election. We'd like you to come and leave your information with us as well. We also have a bus outside, and there are individuals all across the country who have literally been signing our bus. We want you to sign the bus today, all right? To carry this message, amen, as we go forth up around the country. If you have not registered to vote, this is your day. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Very quickly, in the book of Exodus, we find the word. It's my favorite Hebrew word. It's a word called zakar. Someone say zakar. Zakar is a word that we find in the Hebrew text when the Bible says that the cries of the people reach the ears of Elohim. And Elohim zakar the people. That means that God remembered them. But the blessing of the word of Zakar is that it doesn't just mean remembrance, it means remembrance in action. It means that when I remember, I act, I take action because of what I remember. When I think of the goodness of God and all that God has done to me, I gotta do something. My soul cries out, hallelujah. It's remembrance with action. In the midst of this election season, I believe that God is calling us to Zakar, to remember, and to act. I'm going to remember the sacrifices of my ancestors. I'm going to remember the barriers that blocked him from voting. I'm going to remember those on Bloody Sunday. I'm going to remember Mary Evers. But not only am I going to remember my ancestors, I'm going to remember my mother and my father and my children. And I'm not just voting for my children. I'm going to remember my children's children. I'm going to vote for their future. Is there anybody here? Unfortunately, it's not the worst racial massacre in American history. That would be in Arkansas, uh, but it's one of the worst. And we look at the amount of property damage, the amount of lives lost. We have a thriving black economic ecosystem, and out of jealousy, frankly, pure jealousy, uh, that community is raised. It's the only time in American history that bombs have been dropped on America. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Last person who 
Saw Them Alive with Sarah Collins Rudolph. The young girls were uh, primping and tying on sasses, fixing each other's hair before going up for worship. And then she says, everything went black. The bomb exploded. And when she came to, she began calling out for her sister. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the girl's uh, head was decapitated in the uh, bombing, and they were immediately perished. Uh, the bomb was so impressive. All over here were homes and businesses. Glass from the glass scattered throughout this community for blocks. The glass across the street in the buildings was blown out as well. There was a gaping hole here. Four girls died. Sarah Collins Rudolph, who was closest to the blast, lost her eye and also had other issues of, of debris deeply implanted within her skin that she said surfaced for years. Dozens of others were hurt or harmed, both physically and psychologically in many ways. Some of the persons who were in this building when it exploded have a hard time even today hearing glass break and some of them have had difficulty being in enclosed spaces for so long, part of that post-traumatic uh, uh, experience uh, from, uh, from being here during the bombing. Uh, but again, these four girls uh, perished, but they're not the only people who died, interestingly enough. Well, there were actually multiple people as part of that spilling over violence uh, that happened on September the 15th, 1963. This, is, uh, this was a turning point obviously in the civil rights movement, uh, the death of children, just to kind of give a time capsule. 1963, Mega Evers is killed, June 12th of 63, uh, in fight for voting rights in Mississippi. Uh, August 28th, 1963, you have the March on Washington. September 15th of 1963, you have the death of these little girls. November 22nd of 1963, you have the assassination of a U.S. president. You have all of this happening within months of each other, this main violence. But all of it kind of worked together to turn towards the passage in 1964 of the uh, Civil Rights Act. All on the heels of all of this unfortunate uh, death and destruction in the nation. Most of this, the history of, of, of the struggle in Birmingham, particularly around young people, happens right here. So when you look on the film and you see water hoses turned on people, you're standing right where it happened. When you see the dogs, it's right here. When you see the young people running in the park uh, away from the firemen and from the police officers with the hoses and the dogs, and you have to know something about the, the, the power of those fire hoses it was so powerful it would rip the bark off trees. And so if you were hit with the full blunt of force, it would break ribs, right? So we're talking about significant harm to children, right? This was largely a children of one movement. Matter of fact, uh, there's something called the Birmingham Children's March, where they literally began to march children in the streets in mass arrests of children uh, as a way of, of tipping the scales of justice. But all this history just comes just right here, so tight. So you can you can all you can feel what's happening. Um, they would march down these steps. The church, once again, black church, focal point of the movement, place of gathering, a hush arc. And after getting strategy and getting training, the young people would rush down those steps would take their formation on the sidewalk and the streets and they would get them begin their march they wouldn't get a block down the road because they were met with bull connor and his tank right and the fire uh, men and the police officers who were intended to, to keep them those who were not arrested would then flood back into the church for more instruction the injured would be taken to the church or maybe taken to a hospital. Uh, but that's why this church in particular uh, was attacked. 
you had a chance to kind of walk through the park according to the numbering, um, you'll know that the bombing of 16th Street was in response to the advancement of having um, gotten the signs, the segregation signs, the whites only, colored only signs removed. So earliest of you, if you saw in the history, kind of this fight um, begins like April of 63, and then there is a response where a negotiation is had, and then um, where there's an agreement to remove the signage, and that happens through, you know, May and June, July, up to August. And then in September, you have what, what has been referred to as white rage in response to the advancement, and Michael has mentioned that before, about when there's black progress, there is equal and actually even a more violent um, response to, to that progress. That's Dr. King's first church, and the only church that he pastored by himself. The Selma to Montgomery march for voting rights, of course, which Wallace was against, literally takes Dr. King up this road with 50,000 people past the church that he pastored directly to the place where Wallace said, segregation now and forever, and Dr. King delivers his speech with Wallace looking from atop at the masses of people who come to demand voting rights. It's a movie script. It's unbelievable. And if you keep down this road, you go to the slave auction. So the people march past the slave auction block past the place where the civil rights movement begins in earnest to the very Capitol building to declare we want voting rights. But it gets better. Over here is the first White House of the Confederacy. <laughs> so you have all this mashing of history in this one single place that culminates ultimately in the right to vote. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's amazing.